Hello there. It's James Arnold Taylor, the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Johnny Test. Fred Flintstone. And one of my personal favorites, Leonardo. And you are listening to Epic Tales from the Sewer. It's totally awesome. Turtle power. Go, go, go. Welcome, everybody, to another fantastic episode of Epic Tales from the Sewers, your Turtles podcast, starring Justin. I'm your host with my co-host, Eric Will. How you doing, Eric? Doing all right. A little tired, a little tired, but I'm doing good. How about you there, Justin? Dude, I, I couldn't be more excited. Uh, we have a guest today. It's been a, a little while since we had a guest. One mm-hmm. I'm really excited about. Our, uh, our guest today is the artist Ken Garing. Uh, whose credits include uh, covers for the IDW TMNT series issues 35, um, let's see, so 104 and 124, with interiors on issues 51 and 52. Ken is also the creator, writer, and artist of the image comic series Planetoid from 2012, Planetoid Praxis from 2017, as well as the book Gogor. Let's welcome our guest today, Ken Gehring. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, so um, your uh, your turtles journey. I'm sure I'm going to ask um, some questions about that, but um, e- even kind of before that, I wanted to ask, what's it like to have a quote about um, in your author page uh, to be from Warren Ellis? Um, how does that? <laughs> he says a creator in the forefront of the new American science fiction comics. How does that feel looking at that on the page? <laughs> That's super nice. It was really generous of him. That was at the time where there was like a couple different titles coming out mostly from image science fiction books so it was really nice of him to say that yeah that's that's a big accolade and um other than that this one was a bit more obscure but i saw uh, robin williams was a fan of your work yeah that wow. was another weird thing it was the same book planetoid and uh you know he was a huge science fiction fan and you know read all that like new wave stuff and um read comics and yeah there was a I think it was like a talk that he did just like spontaneously at a comic book shop and people asked him, what's your favorite comic right now? And he said, uh, Planetoid. And he mentioned, uh, Brandon Graham, uh, his book at the time, I think it was King city. That's Um, so cool. But yeah, blew my mind. Yeah. That was nice of him. Wow. Did you ever, did you ever get to hear from, from him or anything or was it just kind of like that blurb? I bumped into him at, um, you know, he lived near San Francisco. Um, where, where I am. And there's a pretty well-known uh, bookstore called Green Apple Books. And I bumped into him. My mom was with me and she <laughs> she's like, I'm a big fan of your work. And I mean, I was just sort of standing there. I didn't really meet him, but you know, I just like nodded. But oh, um, that's fantastic. yeah, I wish, I wish I, I mean, you know, apparently he, he would sometimes reach out to people and, you know, compliment their work. And um, so, yeah, that was a big deal. That's that's so cool. That that kind of blew my mind, and I was like, "Wow, you know." Um, and, th- and that was just really exciting. And uh, Warren Ellis, man, that's that's another one. Just really, Transmetropolitan was such a great book. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I, I was even reading today, comics really that's heavily like, at that time. Yeah, for sure, the, absolutely. It, and it was weird too because like the Vertigo was now was what probably independent comics are now. You know, and it's it's kind of shifted away from from that style. Uh, yeah. It's funny how this happens, but yeah, image image is awesome. Um, um, is uh, Gogor with image or is it uh, uh, self published? Because I know you had a Kickstarter out for it. Yeah, it was kind of a weird thing with that. It was I, I just wanted to go as many issues as I could, and so I, I did like five issues at image, and it was more of a matter of like not being able to keep it up. I mean, the sales were like okay, but uh, so I sort of ended it, but still had more ideas for it. So I did like um, a little second part on Kickstarter, uh, nice. this like 64 page Gogor book, um, which got funded and everything. So I was happy to be able to do it. But yeah, the original uh, series was with Image. 
Oh, that's that's great. So issues one through five. So this is cool. Um, before I obviously ask you about turtles again, um, I had some questions about your art style and um, and just some of your influences here. Um, a couple influences that I I could see, especially in like the lands landscapes and all that. I noticed um, a little bit of like Barry Windsor Smith and Mobius, with maybe a tinge of Jim Henson and Brian Froud with some of your creature creations. Who are some of your uh, your inspirations for your art style? Uh, it's it's really it's really all over the place. I feel like it was kind of like a big mess of influences, and now I'm I'm trying to like consolidate it. Um, but uh, Mobius for sure. Um, Barry Windsor Smith actually. I when I was young in the '90s reading comics, I read his Storytell. He had this oversized book called Storyteller. It was an anthology. Yeah, it's kind of a weird. Yeah, I read that. Um, Barry Windsor Smith, but yeah, Mobius, all, all the people you mentioned, uh, the really big one is Richard Corbin. It's, uh, and that's kind of a Ninja Turtle related thing. Cause I discovered yes. Richard Corbin through Kevin Eastman's heavy metal special that he did in the nineties where it was an all Corbin issue. And that was, I was like a teenager then. And that was just, it was just all Corbin since then. So, um, He's not really a guy you can imitate, but some of his principles, <laughs> yeah. the idea of form, these heavy, heavy volume, people don't usually do volume in comics, but Richard Corbin is all about volume, heavy shapes and things. So that, that was a big deal to me, and I'm still trying to do that somehow in my own art. But um, and I like Frank the... Miller. Frank Miller oh, has to Frank be Miller, yeah. for sure, yeah. I, I was thinking a little bit of Miller, but I was also thinking a little bit of like uh, John Romita Jr. and such, like with yeah. uh, the shading, which is is both like it's it's like with with John Romita, I've got kind of like a, a love hate relationship because some things I see and I'm like, wow, this is beautiful. And then he draws a woman, and I'm like, oh, you know, it's just the same thing with Frank Miller, where it's it's just like, okay, maybe that your style doesn't completely fit this or anything. So it's like. I was really admiring in uh, Gogor, which I was I was looking at earlier. I love the clean lines on, on um, like just like the regular human characters and all that. And in comparison to Gogor himself, who is is just kind of like this mass, you know, and he's so like like detailed and crossed at. I'm like, oh, he is cool looking, you know. It's a it's a really nice kind of a uh, 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 diverse style that you have, and I, I really enjoy it. Thank you. That's really nice of you. Thank you. Let's see. Um, when uh, when you were a kid, we talked about this a little bit, but what what were uh, you into reading when you were a kid? Uh, besides that, Barry Windsor Smith anthology book. <laughs> I mean, I, I read a lot. I've always been a, a comic book reader that's like very all over the place. I, I don't really read long. Care about the character? Like it has to. I don't know. I like miniseries and one shots and graphic novels and. Um, so I was all over the place, but the typical stuff, uh, Punisher, um, uh, Eric Larson, Todd McFarlane, Spider-Man, um, the image books, uh, Ninja Turtles, which we'll talk about for sure. But the, the Mirage books and the, um, which I got in the reprint, I'm sure a lot of people talk about that color, you know, the over the first publishing. Oh yeah, man. Uh, yeah. Ninja Turtles color reprint. So those books, like actually getting them at the bookstore and um, and the Archie, the adventures as well. Like all the Jim, I, I always love Jim Lawson. I, I think he's like really high level, amazing artist. Yeah, his his composition um, is really, really something special. Like on uh, when he puts everything on the page, like just how it all works compositionally. I, I think that he's a master at that. Some pe people either get it or they don't with him, but I, I think he's like an artist artist. I, I think he's he's working on a so this especially the Archie stuff. The the stuff Jim Lawson did with Archie is doesn't look like anything else. It's it's you know, I still go back and look at it. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm a big but yeah, Frank artist. Miller. No, I'm sorry. Uh Frank Miller, you're saying? Yep. Oh yeah, Frank Miller like um Again, this is all like 90s stuff when I was a teenager. Um, and then the other one, too, is like heavy metal, Simon Bisley and discovering all those heavy metal artists, Mobius and uh, Libertore, uh, Serpieri and uh, Manara and uh, Manara and um, uh, Hugo Pratt, you know, the NBM books, uh, those like uh, reprints, Arkham, 
they were reprinting a lot of Archrom in the nineties. So yeah, yeah, the Fantagraphic stuff. I was reading all oh, of yeah. it. I was you know looking at all this stuff. For the the younger listeners, uh, Heavy Metal was a, a magazine that eventually uh, Kevin Eastman would go on and purchase and publish. Uh, he would he would uh, self publish that. But there was a lot of sci fi, and it tended to go towards the um, the more adult crowd. I'll put it that way. But um, it was really cool, interesting avant garde art stuff, and the stuff that was in this was not tackled by comics. It was it was like seeing a, a graphic novel of a short story from sci-fi or maybe fantasy, but more likely sci-fi. And it was it was some great stuff at times. And sometimes it was scary, you know, and, and sometimes it was humorous. But they would go with a lot of different artists, uh, most notably uh, Mobius and um, uh, Simon Bisley. So, you know. But I mean, like even even like I think they had covers by like Julie Bell and Boris Vallejo at one point, oh, yeah. you know, son, you know, like so everybody, everyone kind of touched it in that genre. So, yeah, yeah I think no. for a while there, it was like a, it was kind of a hub, you know, heavy metal, different. They would interview people and, you know, it was short stories. So all sorts of artists would, you know, American, European, uh, they would feature a lot of different art. But, yeah, it was definitely more mature audience. Yeah, and that's that's kind of that was kind of a step up from Mirage Comics, which were were doing it with like Melting Pot. I think that was kind of what Kevin was trying to do, and then it's just like, all right, I'll just buy this and and do it because they already have the branding for it, which made sense, you know, the the whole Tundra Press and all that, and and Melting Pot and all that went into that. But basically, it's kind of like that's what Mirage was trying to do anyway. So, and, and they were definitely king of the independents until Image Comics came around. So. Yeah, it's actually kind of a weird relationship, the heavy metal, because I, I almost feel like Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman treated Ninja Turtles like that. You know, they would feature very oh, unusual I, artists and underground, you know, Corbin and uh, Mark Bode Michael and all, all these. Yeah, sure. Uh, Tom Veach. And so, I mean, really oh, out there God, artists to bring in. Book. Yeah, that, like that's that's one of those hallmarks where it's like a lot of fans our age too can they're like oh man remember Veach's art i'm like yes <laughs> like that's literally like the first thing i saw after the cartoon and i'm like whatever this is i am a hundred percent in you know <laughs> like wait a minute Raphael is a snapping turtle and he's fighting a giant leech bloodsucker <laughs> okay i'm in sign me up 100 <laughs> percent that's why it was yeah. so great, though, is, is the art, you know, the, the, you're a kid, you watch the cartoon, and then there's this Mirage comic and the Archie comic, and it was just, all of them were just totally creative and interesting and weird, and um, it was just a great universe or whatever, you know, to, to have thrown at you as a kid. I mean, um, so yeah, I, I ate it all up, and, you know, just like everyone else did. I'm surprised I haven't seen you do a Hellboy cover, because I, I think that you would do really well with that character. I'd love to, Yeah. I'm a big, big Mike Manola fan. He's I met him once too, and he was really nice uh, early on. Um, but yeah, I would love to for sure. That's yeah, I, a guess, great I can see that doing well. Yeah. So let's let's dive into your uh, your history with turtles here. Uh, what's what's your particular origin story? How did how did you get into turtles as a kid? Mm -hmm. uh, like we were saying, you know, the the whole launch of the cartoon and toys was like a big big deal and then i think it was pretty early on i was at a bookstore and saw that first published you know i didn't really know about like graphic novels i got comics from like the comic book store the spinner rack at the supermarket but this was at a bookstore and um it was the oversized the first four issues of yeah. the mirage series printed in color and it's you know kevin eastman and peter laird and i'm, I'm right at that age where i'm kind of starting to understand who the artists are a little bit like John Romita Jr. has the signature. It's really, you know, the JR JR yep. signature. Like you see I'm it, starting to, you know, yeah, I'm starting to put it together. And in this case, it's very obvious that it's these two guys that created it. And um, that book itself, it's just everything else aside. It's just really a good comic. Those first four, four issues, even just that first issue where they fight Shredder, it's just really good. It's a really yeah. good, even the lettering is cool. Like it's just really well made. And, um, yeah, I don't know. It's that book sort of started this whole thing where it's like, I want to draw comics. Um, I want to do what I see in this book. And um, so, you know, back then it was like comics were just sort of around. I have an older brother who read like Mad Magazine. And like I say, at the spinner rack, I would like 
go look at the comics and buy a comic and it's kind of random and comic book stores were, were popular and stuff. So it yeah, was because it would be lost such boys. a niche thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. And all that, just all that culture of just, you know, yeah. going, riding your bicycle to the store and, you know, garbage pail kids and all that stuff. Oh, uh, definitely. Magazines yep. and comics. And so, um, yeah, I just sort of stuck with it. And also too, it's like at that time, the image, you know, I live in California, central California and the image, I guess they would do signings all over the country, but they would do a lot of Bay Area stuff. There was a lot of Bay Area oh, that's cool. conventions and stuff like that. So I would come out and, and show my art to like Eric Larson and the, the people who were there. And um, I just stuck with it. And then eventually went to art school and just worked regular jobs for years and uh, then got, got published eventually. Nice. So you got to you got to show your stuff to Eric Larson. That's fantastic. Still one of my favorite Spider-Man artists, by the way. I think he's super yeah. underrated. Him and Mark Bagley, I, I think, are number one for me. Not that I'm the biggest Spider-Man, no. but I, I know what I like. Yeah. No, his old Spider-Man stuff was fantastic. I, I look at it still, especially when he was inking himself and stuff, doing oh, a regular so Spider-Man good. title. Yeah. There's this one cover that he did with Spider-Man and Beast, and I don't know what issue it is, but I think it's number just fifteen. Going, <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of like the best things I've ever seen. <laughs> so with it, the yellow with, background, yes. Oh my god, it's, it's so it, yeah. it just pops. It's it's gorgeous. And and, uh, and I'm a big defender of Liefeld on this. I know a lot of people yeah. are kind of like iffy on him. I I love his stuff. His early stuff, especially, is so underratedly just fantastic. If if anybody ever gets a chance to check out What If Wolverine Became a uh, Agent of Shield. It is one of the most beautiful books in parts, like with some of the splash pages and all that from Liefeld. So, yeah, no, I was a big Rob Liefeld fan for for years and years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that's cool. So, Image, right? Um, what uh, what were you into in, uh, for Image? What did you like? Who was your character? Uh, I liked the Rob Liefeld. I like Savage Dragon. I like Mark yeah. Silvestri yeah. stuff. I liked pretty much all of it. I don't know if I ever read Shadowhawk, but um, <laughs> it was. Uh, you know, or uh, the Willis Portacio stuff. Uh, wet works, oh, like wet, uh, wet yeah. works. Yep, yep. Wet yeah, works look good. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I remember anything from it other than it's like they were all wearing armor or cyborgs or something. But yeah, yeah, I, I was no, probably, good. Uh, yeah, I was a wild storm guy myself. So all the yeah, no, the wild the, the quality was really pretty. high for a while there. They they, they put yeah, out the, the people quality and everything. Yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty good for a while there, but yeah, it kind of got. Um, out of control. <laughs> well, that's that's good. So um, you mentioned uh, the toys as well. Were you a, a toy collector? Are you still a toy collector? Those uh, two two different questions for you. I say, looking at I Eric's think... shelf, <laughs> <laughs> right back there is like you see like three shelves of like nothing but like toys just there. Like, right You're there, making me jealous see... because. Uh... Go ahead. No, I was just saying, like, just like. These ladies like there's like a bunch of shells and they're all like turtles. And then if you look that way, there's more figures right there. That's oh, just wow. nice. A He's got a layer, a fraction. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, kind of like a turtle shell. I've I've become a toy seller recently. Um, okay. I have to say, but I've, I've been purging a lot of stuff, comics, books, uh, toys. But I still have my Ninja Turtle toys. Uh, a lot of them. But as a kid, I was I was way into the whole thing for sure. The playmate stuff, yeah, uh, and they were great. They were really good toys too. I mean, people mm -hmm. now are going back and appreciating them even more. Um, but yeah, no, I was I was really, and all my friends, you know, everybody was. It was really such a wide. It's hard to explain like how widespread it was with no internet. It was just like you would go, yeah, and you, you would go to a kid's house, your friend's house, and he would have these toys, the ones you know you don't have, and so you know it's just a whole culture of. We're like holy stuff. crap who's this oh that's sergeant bananas mm -hmm. what you know <laughs> that's, that's half court i've never heard of him you know <laughs> yeah no I, absolutely that's that's really cool yeah we we had um we had a gentleman on uh who wrote a whole book called rad plastic about the uh the playmates uh it was it was really fun so that was uh chris fawcett uh listeners can go back and check that one out um, I wanted to ask you about your covers. Uh, I had already kind of uh, buried the lead on this one, but um, moving on to TMT, uh, you've done some iconic covers, at least I think so. And um, the one that comes specifically to mind is issue 124. It's the four brothers on a rooftop sitting on a huge gargoyle in the snow. 
Um, it, it is like, to me, that's something that should be displayed in every Ninja Turtles fan uh, house around winter or Christmas time. It is, um, it's really cool. Um, where, um, where did that come from? Did you have kind of an idea for, um, what you wanted to do for that? I know that's a super uh, it, specific question, but, um, I just really like that one. <laughs> well, on, on that particular one, it was suggested, I'm trying to think of what exact, what the exact suggestion was, but the, the editor, Bobby Kernow, he said something about them, like, um, on a stakeout or something like they're waiting in the snow. He didn't say mm -hmm. the thing about the gargoyle, but the idea of them waiting in the snow. And um, so it did. It did have that prompt. Yeah, I like it because it it does give me that idea of like Mike Mignola, where it's you you've got like the great use of like negative space with like the dark shading, but also it's it's got kind of a gothic Batman look to it, and I just really enjoy it. Yeah, now, I was, now I was, I was I'll have a picture up to show people. Yeah, were you you must have been a Batman fan then if you're a Frank Miller guy? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I didn't read. To be honest with you, I, I haven't read so many Batman comics. Um, I mean, obviously, like Dark Knight and stuff. But, the, you know, the animated series was popular. And, I mean, everyone likes, you know, Batman, the the, the Michael Keaton movies and stuff. But um, mm -hmm. it's weird. I don't know. I've, I've bought a few random Batman issues over the years. But I actually don't really have a huge collection of Batman comics. I like what you said about one shots and miniseries and stuff like that. Cause as a Batman fan, you could literally just do that and be satisfied and not have to go through and, and understand like what's going on in the main continuity of the Batman book. And you know, Oh, this is pre rebirth or this is new 52. Like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like here he is and he's teaming up with death blow from image and they're going to go on an adventure. <laughs> you know, it's like, Oh, okay. Uh, does it mean anything? No. Okay, all right, cool. Now he's teamed up with, uh, I don't know, Captain America, and it's uh, from John Byrne. All right, cool. You know, it's, you know, you you can just enjoy that, and and still be like, yeah, this is fine. You know, it's like listening to your favorite rock group, but they're only playing covers. You know, it's it's like you can still enjoy it. So, <laughs> no, that's, that's true, especially with Batman. That's true. It's yeah, I, I don't know. I never the ongoing series. I don't know if I ever even bought an issue. Yeah, yeah, I don't. It's it's still going on. I don't know what number it is. I I actually just stopped it from my poll list because I, I'm like, you know what? I haven't read one in two years, and I'm still buying them. I think it's I think it's time. So, <laughs> I like I when uh, Greg Greg Capullo was doing it. It looked it looked pretty good, but I, I never really read it. He's fantastic for the record. He was he was so yeah. nice when when I met him and um. Like we thought he was going to be like, like grumpy and stuff because he looks like a big biker and stuff like that, you know, but it's like, he just, he was like the nicest guy. He's like, Oh, you like the new 52, huh? You know, it's just like talking and I'm like, this guy is amazing. And I mean, you talk about an iconic artist from like independence and all that, that guy made spawn after uh, McFarlane left. It was all Capullo. And, yeah. and now you put him on Batman, and if you go and look in the top three Batman stories ever, and I know this is Ninja Turtles podcast, I'll get back to that in a second. But um, <laughs> you know, if you look at like what are the top three stories for Batman of all times, you're going to get probably Night's End, where he gets where his uh, back broken, Court of Owls, which is his that he did, and uh, Dark Knight Returns. Those are going to be the top three on pretty much every list. So that's uh, that's some serious cred. No, for sure. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, it's yeah, nice little segue there. I, I <laughs> appreciate that because we rarely get a chance to talk about anything other than turtles, but it's nice when it kind of doves tails back into it. it. And I think he did one. Um, I think he did a cover for the uh, the one hundred project for um, uh, Heroes. Uh, oh, uh, really? Was, okay. Yeah, the yeah, Heroes think, Initiative. Heroes, the Hero Initiative. Yeah, I think he did one. So that's pretty cool. But, but um, I, I wanted to ask you about this one because this this is a pretty big deal. Uh, when you worked on issue fifty one, did you have any idea what an important character Jenica was going to be? Did they um, did they kind of give you any idea about her? No, no, they didn't. Uh, it was that was a funny thing, but uh, yeah, she went on to to become a turtle. <laughs> yeah, but, mm -hmm. but no, I had no idea. I didn't know. You're, and it's funny too because you're part of the zeitgeist. You know, you were there at her birth. You you got to tell us what she looks like and how she was going to act and stand and all that. And it's like it's such an important piece of the puzzle. 
when we go back because it was just 40 issues or so until she did actually turn into a turtle but it was yeah, this right. assassin and we found out that she was a punk rocker and you know kind of an orphan and stuff like she's got this really rich back back uh story and uh i i guess you could say like as being like a big big fan of the character i've had brahm Ravel on where we uh hopefully we'll get to talk to tom waltz very soon but um and now having having you on and i mean it's we're we're definitely fans of the character, you know. I um I I saw you sent a link that you had a a commission piece up on eBay at the moment. Uh yeah, it was actually um like I said, it was kind of I've kind of been like cleaning and I found these uh the sketch covers. You know, if you do the issue, you get all the comps. You 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 know the artists, the the people involved get the uh, copies of the comics. So I had nice. these these blank sketch covers that I completely. Yeah, you know, they're just sitting in a box, and so I just sort of felt inspired. I've sold artwork like on my website before, but never on eBay. So I just was like, "Oh, I'll just quickly do a drawing on this, you know, get it out of the apartment." Yeah, um, why not? Before it gets banged up or something. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's just that one single uh, cover. It's number fifty-one with a drawing I did of uh, Jenica, like partially mutating into a turtle. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. I saw the arm is is changed. So yeah, yeah. I would like to do a whole thing of her like that. I, I was like, that's kind of a cool, like, a partial ninja ninja turtle. You know, just the arm or something. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, uh, up on eBay for now. So I'll see if you know people are interested. They can. Dig. Have you um have you ever slipped any of your characters from Planetoid or uh, Gorg uh, into any of their work? Possibly issue one hundred four's cover. Uh, we have one of four. Um, no, uh, no, I haven't. I don't think I have. I, th I feel like I did put some reference in, in something somewhere, but I don't maybe a piece of graffiti or something. I don't know, but no, none, none of the characters. I think I draw. Do you think if you do another cover, you'd try? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if there's an you know, opportunity, tough, you yeah, to, if you have not? to get stuff like like approved and all that, now you got like Nickelodeon, I, I, w, or IDW and Paramount and all that. But you know, like like there's always there's always Easter eggs. You know, like um, Ben Bishop put uh, Kino in in uh, Last Throne in issue two. So mm -hmm. you know? nice. All right. Yeah. No, I feel like I have done little stuff. I'm drawing a blank now, but you know, three in the morning if you're drawing, it's it is easy sometimes to put a little weird thing in there. You know. Um, but not that not that I re remember. <laughs> That's cool. Hey, come up, go on. Old Hob is getting angry, so my cat my cat is is trying to join in on the on the podcast here. So I'm surprised yeah. mine's not. She but um, sitting right here. You're um talking about Gogor a little bit. Um, the the first just so everybody knows, the first issue was available. Um, I'm gonna put a link to it in the show notes and all that, so you can go through and and read it. Issues one through five are available th from Image, and then the Kickstarter kind of picks up from there. Um, I, I wanted to ask, how did the Kickstarter go last year? Uh, it went good. It, it got funded. Um, it, again, that was sort of just like a testing the water type thing. It's it's kind of a weird project. I, I just I had enough people emailing me and asking me if there's going to be any more comics that I thought that I would be able to pull it off, but. Uh, it was successful. I have good things to say about Kickstarter and the people I worked with to oh, that's great. have it printed and stuff. So I don't know. I just, I, I really wish that there was um, more cohesion in the industry as it exists. You know, I preferred it to get published and have stuff on shelves. Um, but the Kickstarter thing is, was good. Yeah. It's a good I think it's difficult. It's difficult now too, because you, as always, you have, you know, the big two. And with those, it's like, all right, if you work there, you pretty much work on their terms. And it's tough if you're a creator owned, then they don't even look at you. But they've got the largest market share. Then you've got a place like Image, which is great because you own that. But there's a whole system of rules that they have in place, too. And it's like, all right, you come down to what's your pre-orders and things like that. So it's it's tough. I think Kickstarter is great because it gives the fans a chance to go for something that they like. And I mean, if you're into if you're into a weird, you know, book about like like post apocalyptic dogs or something like that, they have something for you. If you want, you know, them to re-release issue number eight of the Mirage Ninja Turtles, there's a venue for you. You know, it's like there's all those sort of things. 
I, I've had good luck with it. I um I know some people have gotten burned on these or Indiegogos, so I'm, I'm glad that this is mm-hmm. going well for you. You know, and is this um is it uh like all uh, of the issues are coming out in individually, or are they going to be in like a, a collection? How are they going to be printed, or were they? Printed well, the actually? the original uh, five issues at Image were were collected into a trade paperback, and then awesome. this um kickstarter thing was just called the book of gog War, and it was just a single 64 page uh little addendum like uh, you know extra story at the end there was just an aspect to the story i didn't get to tell so it was like that final chapter basically i'd like to have it all collected uh properly maybe at some point in the future but yes so it's that's that's the way it wound up getting published yeah that's that's pretty cool um, what kind of research do you do uh, when you're trying to create a new creature, like in Glogor? Because, um, I mean, when you start out, the first thing that you see is this shrew um, that, that uh, is a little bit more surprising than than you would see at first. And I was like, oh, he's being chased by people on giant ants. I'm like, this is really kind of cool creature creation. I was uh, interested in your process. Um thanks for saying that uh i with gogor in particular i was kind of getting um i felt like there was this trend in fantasy art of like loading up the characters with all this gear which which is cool everyone likes that i like it but that's a very like illustrative thing and um i wanted to for comics i I thought maybe i could do something where it's like more stripped down and it's about like real basic shapes, very clear, simple shapes that you could read a mile away, you know. So like the main character wears like a red, he's basically a red triangle. He wears like a red cloak and stuff. And um, Gogor is a big green ball. And, so, you know, making it very <laughs> clear, like you say, the ants, the guys riding on the ants, the big chubby shrew, the big brown shrew. And stuff. it's all of it like reads very and just being very clear with the storytelling. Um, and kind of treating them like toys, you know, like I'm playing with these toys and stuff instead of getting lost in the detail. Um, yeah, it, it gave me vibes of, uh, you know, uh, Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples uh, doing uh, Saga. Like it, it's, it was like that sort of thing where it's like, oh, I want to see where this goes. And, and just like the character designs and all that, I'm like, oh, this is really cool. Because you get to a point in the story, and, and again, I've just read the first issue, but it's like, oh, look at all the biodiversity that's going on here. Like, so, um, and, and we'll get into this too, but it's like a ring of floating islands. And I'm like, oh, does every island have like a different species or something? It's 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 just kind of crazy. Yeah, that was like a, a, I don't know, a lot of the concepts all sort of just came together. It was one of those things that had been in my mind and then kind of like a wacky comic like am i really good because planetoid was a very like serious kind of science fiction dark science fiction story and gogor is like a wacky not wacky but you know more playful that so um well, the, yeah with humor and stuff, once so. i got going it was it was easy to make up characters on the page and stuff because it was it felt familiar you know so the, it was kind of spontaneous a lot of the, the stuff in, oh in the okay I, I was going to ask because I, I obviously haven't read all five issues, but um, with these this ring of floating islands and all that, do we know if there's anything either above or below them? Uh, that was something I never got around to talking okay. about, but there there was an idea about that. Um, but it's it's never discussed in the comic. It's not okay, revealed. So we'll we'll have to wait in 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 case you feel that uh, there'll there'll be some more stuff, but um, it'll be interesting to see what's kind of out of that. Uh, it it gave me some some real vibes. Like I said, the the story seems like like it's it's got a lot going on with the characters and and just kind of like the diversity of it. Um, and by that I mean it's like nobody looks the same. Everybody looks like they're from a different sort of alien race for the most part, which is kind of cool. And um. I, I thought it, I thought it was cool. I, I'm going to actually have to check out the other issues because I thought it was really fun. Uh, and um, w- what can you tell us about Gogor himself? Like, what was um, the, and, and for folks who haven't seen him, I mean, you have to kind of think of the Hulk, and um, I mean, maybe mixed with Swamp Thing, but like the Hulk, if he was made That's of like that dirt, was and was mushrooms, and <laughs> no, yeah, it's definitely a, a major Swamp Thing. I mean, I think. People like those characters, you know, Swamp Thing, Man Thing, anything covered with moss and stuff, you know. So, um, but yeah, Gogor is... I was thinking is, Mondo a little. Yeah, yeah sure. 
Um, it's uh, it's a little strange. I mean, he's the title character, but he does, he's kind of a passive character in some ways. And uh, it's more about this boy who's supposed to be assisting Gogor. Um, you know, it's like a prophecy being fulfilled, but it's it's kind of vague throughout the series what they're supposed to do about this deteriorating situation in this in this world that they live in. Uh, so that's part of the mystery is going along with the boy and sort of finding out what is this Gogwar creature? How can he help? And it's revealed throughout the series in the way in which he does help, but it's it's not what you would expect in a in a fantasy adventure. You know, it's it's a more um, humble way of being heroic, I guess, is, is kind of the idea uh, behind the story. But yeah, I, I have the, the geekiest like question. Of, <laughs> I have the geekiest question for you. Um, do, how do the physics of water work when you have a ring of floating islands and all that? Does it flow down from the top? Like, how does that work? And when it yeah, rains, the, does it rain on everything? or There's clouds above. They're, they're sort of rotating a mini sun. Okay. And so as as they rotate around the sun it becomes becomes night and day on each island. And they're kind of floating in a weather system. So there's there's clouds and stuff around them. Mm. Um but is there any is there a larger mass below them? Um I was going to have there be an, an enormous planet of water below them and events in the story would have the 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 island the islands floating down to the water falling. You know, there's a whole uh <laughs> backstory there but yeah there's there's a certain logic to it i don't know if it's uh how realistic it is but it seems to work visually at least oh yeah no absolutely it's stunning it's absolutely stunning and and i mean like within the first two pages it's a circumstance where our our lead character is jumping from one island to the other and after just seeing that you're like oh i understand the gravity of what's going on based on when you see what the world looks like so, and I, I, th I thought it was really cool. So <laughs> I, I enjoyed Thanks. it in other words. So I tried to know. do that. I tried to have like the world revealed through action instead of like starting off with a paragraph, you know, in a world where thus and such, instead of doing that, it's like, let's start with a chase scene and you'll see the world, you know, through the, the chase scene or something. So. What do they call it? In media res? Yeah, right. right. Yeah. It's a very cinematic way of, of doing things. And it's, it's uh, you know, the principles of, uh, of comics is show, don't tell. So yeah you know, that's that, that's very important yeah for sure yeah that's that's pretty fun and um i i mean i like i said i i liked it i'm looking forward to uh reading the rest of these um i wanted to ask what are you working on now did um do you have any uh covers coming out um any variant covers maybe some turtles covers i don't know yeah it's a new series is popping up now i mean never know you might do some I would, yeah. character again I would have thought you would have been an absolute shoe in for issue 150, you know, um, just based on, on since you've done 124 and all that. Mm -hmm. so. No, I'd love to. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it sounds like the dust has finally settled, but for a while there, it was kind of up in the air. I didn't even know who was like the editor or anything yeah, yep. um, at Ninja Turtles. So it's, uh, yeah, for sure. I, I would love to do more. I feel like I never really got to do, you know, all my issues are kind of like fill in issues and they're, they're spread apart. And, you know, so it's, um, I was just simply trying to do like a good job on my issues and get them in on time and draw the Ninja Turtles correctly. And so I, I have, you know, ideas for stuff I would like to do um, with them. So, yeah, I would, yeah I'd love the, to do um... more. A new series that just came out was the uh, the black, white, and green, which is the anthology. So, I mean that that seems like that would be another good venue for you as well. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I just saw that too. I'd love to do it. Nice. What about um? What about future plans for sci-fi? Um, do you have anything else that's uh, maybe on the creative table that you're working on? Yes, I do. I have a series that it's. I kind of got stuck into the mistake of like going back you know i did the first issue and then i'm like you know kind of going back and making corrections and making it bigger but i'm on the second issue now uh it's just going to be a four issue mini series science fiction i hope to do it with image but um i just got to get over the hump and you know i kind of put it away for a while and i i, I want to work on it a little bit more but it's a real tight story real simple story that i've been thinking about for years, working on it for a long time. So I'm hoping to have that announced by the end of the year um, with some, with one publisher or another. Um, but yeah, that's, that's been 
something I've been wanting to get out for a long time. That's that's really cool. Any um, and and you'll be uh, doing the full uh, writer and um, artist and colorist on it. Yeah, yeah, and letterer. But um, oh, nice. Yeah, that's the good letter is so, really underrated. So I mean, uh, you, we were talking about it before. Uh, you know, Steve Steve Levine was the original letterer. Letterer, geez, I can't say letterer. Letterer yeah. for those Mirage is, issues, and I mean that was part of the the book. It was so clear, like to read. It didn't look like slop. They spoke clearly, distinctly, and and it looked like wow, this looks like Marvel or DC. It looks like you're looking at a Jack Kirby book. So I mean, that's that's some of the unsung success of the early Mirage stuff. So you know. No, and I remember point. Walt Simonson was trying to do that too. And um, I think he, he uh, made a point of doing an entire Thor book uh, without putting any, um, <laughs> without putting any dialogue in it. So <laughs> just to show how uh, he could do everything all at once. But yeah, I, I mean, that's, there's a lot to be said about doing that and doing that well. And, and I definitely think that what you're doing is, is really good. Thanks. Yeah. I've got, I've got a lot of ideas for uh, mini series, creator owned series stuff that I want to do. So yeah, I'm hoping to kind of do a couple of them in a row, but um, got to get this current one finished first. But yeah, if you had a it's shot to, to work well. with, um, if, if you had a shot to work with another character, so it, maybe it's a, a Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, anybody. Um, what what kind of uh, characters would you want to work with? Um, like, would it be a Savage Dragon or? Yeah, I like those old uh, image characters I'd, I'd like to do an issue of spawn or something um and try to do it all detail you know try to look at like those old capullo mcfarland um but yeah i like that whole aesthetic of um those original uh image characters uh uh let's see Wait, which character um i kind of want to do more ninja turtles and do more characters that i haven't done um you know I, I never really got to do like a big mutant fight scene you know i really wanted to do like a juicy fight scene you know i didn't get to do too many i think your um, slash like if you made a slash that would be amazing yeah uh, like that exactly mm, like yeah uh, slash metalhead oh metalhead and slash would be crazy like a like a beast <laughs> battle good call eric that's what i'd love to do yeah for sure oh, man. That, that would be two cool. favorite i don't think i've ever seen that I don't think I have either. I mean, I've seen Slash fight Triceratons and all that, but I don't think I've ever seen him fight the big metalhead. One of my favorite covers uh, from the Archie comic, I think it's number 52. Um, and it's uh, those those insect characters, Scumbug, yep. and they're fighting in the sewer. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the, the artist's name now. Uh, Ken, Ken, Ken Mitroni. Is that the one? I, I get yeah. them mixed up sometimes. But um, I had a K. In my yeah, I can see why. Yeah, yep. I, that uh, number I, I always his, wanted to do. There's you got Ken it? right. I don't have that one, but that's that's Ken right there. He oh wow! Yeah, yeah, no, that's it for sure. Wow, that's great. Yeah, that's really. I want to say that's issue twelve. Um, I I think, uh, I believe it's issue twelve. But yeah, uh, Scumbug and Worm, man, that's an amazing issue. So. Yeah, it's it's crazy, and and um, it it's funny too because that issue dovetails so well into like the rest of the series, and like you're saying about like fill-in issues, that could have absolutely been a fill-in issue, you know, just like oh, here's just something funky that happens, some stuff happens around it, and then it's it's done, and then we'll come back and and you know it's going to lead to all this other stuff, and it does. So, but I'm I'm a big Archie guy. That's that was my introduction into turtles, so I love them. Yeah. No, they're great. They're really good. Now, um, do you find time to play any like the Turtles video games or anything else like that? Were you into those as a kid? Uh, as a kid, yeah. I don't even know anything about like recent Turtle. I'm trying to think, but yeah, the the uh, especially the art act actually at the arcade. Those games actually are mm. playing at the arcade. Those were anytime you saw that, you know cabinet that gaming cabinet the ninja turtles it's, i had to play it uh, big hair april <laughs> yeah yeah right like the the late nine the late 80s early 90s hair april and you're like mm -hmm. this is cool you know um so so assuming <laughs> that you were going to play at that arcade um and this kind of leads into who's your favorite turtle who would you play as in that arcade Ooh, this is your question though oh. um i don't i guess donatello's got the reach 
Uh, okay. Yeah. There you go. Right. But who's yeah, your favorite so turtle? Long. That's the question. Uh, I've always been Leonardo. I don't know. It's it's a it's a it's a boring <laughs> answer, but it is know, not boring. I, I, he's, he, he, he's a he's a Leo guy. So <laughs> absolutely. Okay, good. I'm a Leo, Leo guy. I'm in good company. Leo's a planner. He's a planner, and he he knows how to motivate. And you know, um, I I agree. I love the character. Leo is actually one of my favorite comic book characters or fictional characters, and favorite Ninja Turtles. So I I I just love him to death. So. So we'd be fighting over who plays Leo. It's okay, you know. I'd play Donnie. Well, I'd play all, Donnie all day. I don't blame you playing Donnie, you know. And then the next one, he gets that that weird role. You know, that was cool. Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. I was gonna say though, it matters. It matters which incarnation too, though, because I like in the movie in the first movie. I really like Raphael, and Leonardo's a little mm -hmm. annoying. They kind of force um, you to like Raphael, don't they, in that movie, where it's like he goes off and, and he has like all this stuff going on. I'm still going to like Leo no matter what. I mean, you can, no, you can put on Rise of the TMNT and I'm still going to like Leo. I don't care. It's just my <laughs> they, they They were growing. They were still teenagers. They were they were trying to mature, and yeah. they had to go through that part and that step and their you know, maturity part of their life, I guess you could say. Now they're teenagers. I mean, I deal with teenagers all day, so <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm Luckily, dealing with right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nine years old, going on fifteen. So I'm just glad they're not ninjas. So <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. They're not armed. Yeah. Now, now you're you're a new father. Uh, congratulations on that. Um, you. Are you are you uh, getting anything for um, for your child that is uh, turtle related? You know, and and later on you'll be like, hey. I uh I did issue fifty one. You know <laughs> they'll be all excited. That's that's a funny question. Yeah, no, I haven't I haven't thought that far ahead. Um, just taking it a day at a time right now. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, I I should build it up so that I can I can turn around and uh, brag about it. Right. You should so. you should take one of one of the covers that you did or some of the pictures that you did, put it on a onesie and <laughs> get a picture <laughs> in the onesie and. <laughs> And it'll be like it'll idea. be like I made this, and it's like a hat on a hat, you know. <laughs> It'd be a good story to tell, you know, you know, future uh, future spouse, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, they're they're future down the road. This is a picture yeah. of dad showing me, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Or or likewise, you could do that with Gogor, you know, and be like, hey, check it out. This is the Gogor yeah, cosplay, you, go. yeah. you know. I so you fun. dress as Gogor, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, next that's Kickstarter is uh, Gogor onesie. Why not? I mean, hey, you know, do they do they oh, come in uh, 3X adult? <laughs> I hope not. But <laughs> And if you buy today, you get the special green one. No, 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 no. We're we're okay. <laughs> oh man, that's that's just uh frightening, isn't it? But uh <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, what about what about something like an animated series or anything else like that? Um, do you think that Gogor would lend itself to um, something of uh, animation, like similar in like the uh, like the Ralph Bakshi or um, you know kind of uh, maybe even like like the Netflix type of stuff? Like, do you think that that would be a good mini series or show? Yeah, I I mean when I did the series, it was like. I'm going to do this series and I don't know if it's totally like marketable. It's got a weird name. I didn't really think in those terms. Um, but at the same time, I feel like it, it would work really well as, as a cartoon or, um, you know, I always thought it'd be cool to have like toys of the characters that kind of, look, I was oh, yeah. them as toys uh, being real simple and colorful and stuff. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, Someone I can. At I can Netflix, send me an email. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Well, luckily we've we've got them on speed dial, so we'll we'll put the word for you. <laughs> true, true story, though, guys. I did I did meet the creator of Netflix one time. I had I had an interview with him uh, for a job, and uh, at the time he was working for Redbox. So I had, I had flown out to Chicago, and now I live in Chicago. But and I had flown out, and I met him, and all that. And this was the time, just to give you a time capsule of when this was. Final Destination Five came out and it was on like a screener disc and i walked into his office i'm like oh cool he's got final destination five wow this guy must be connected so you know and i did a whole interview for Redbox and all that with him um you know zoom zoom a couple years later and all that and now i think Redbox is all but defunct but their their machines yeah. are still there but, but yeah no so i i met him you know and it was it was interesting i'm like oh okay cool you know interesting fella you know 
but um, I, I didn't end up taking that job because it didn't pay. So, but um, you know, <laughs> not to be not to be anticlimactic, but but just to tell you, it was it was cool, you know, to meet someone who was like that. I'm like, oh wow, this guy's like super connected like that. So, and now he's probably rich as hell. So, no, oh, yeah, for sure, it's a little bit. Yeah, it's it's interesting <laughs> stuff. Yeah. So um, so we got some stuff on on hopefully um for uh, the the coming year something's uh, going on um that you're not able to announce yet um what about are you doing any appearances do you have any gallery showings like um where can folks find you like that sort of thing uh for right now it's just on uh instagram i've been sort of you know uh off the scene for a while but um i also have some work that didn't get published that i'm hoping that i've already done past work that i'm hoping will um get published this year so um it was a project weirdly enough with heavy metal oh cool I don't even it's kind of like defunct now so yeah yeah it's it's um, in like a weird flux isn't it yeah i think i think there's rumblings about someone picking it up which and it's a real shame i mean it's i thought it, it was just great. pretty digital at this point which i think is a good idea but that's you know i mean it's just the people who got it before will get it you know, it's not really attracting new clients. Yeah, no, it's 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 in this weird like flux, and it happened right at this point where I was like, you know, oh, I'm, I'm doing work that's going to be in heavy metal. That's like a you know a goal of mine. But so in any case, in one form or another, I hope it gets published. It's done with the actor writer Dan Fogler, who did. Uh, he's done a few different comics, but um, the action figure band, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, that's, so uh, that is the least of his accomplishments. But um, if if anyone knows Fantastic Beasts and where to find him, he played Jacob, and um, he was in Balls of Fury. If you've ever seen that movie, Chris, Christopher Walken, Walken and uh, Maggie Q. So, yeah, <laughs> no, he's, he's a interesting guy. He's he's a really nice guy, very creative guy. But um, he did a series. It was called Brooklyn Gladiator, and it had uh, Simon Bisley did the uh, artwork on the first few issues and did the covers. So. Anyways, I, I'm hoping that'll come out because I did kind of a lot of pages. But um, oh, that's cool. But yeah, and then just my creator own projects. Uh, I might do another Kickstarter too for just like a short story collection. Um, but yeah, for right now, it's just uh, kind of dealing with the aftermath of the of the baby. But yeah, yep. um, yeah, maybe later this year I'll have some stuff out. That's cool. I I personally hope that you uh, get in touch with Turtles uh, at IDW and get a, uh, mm -hmm. a, a black, white, and green story going on because I, I think that'd be fantastic. Because you, sure. you you're the whole package writer, artist, bottle washer, and head cook, you know. So that that'll be fun. <laughs> I'm gonna post um, I'm gonna post a link to your Instagram just so everybody can find you and they can take a look at it. The Kickstarter has ended, but you can go to the page and you can look at it. As I mentioned, um, for Gogor, you can get the first issue for free on Image Comics. So it was pretty cool. Um, can folks still buy uh, the issues um, if they need to? Like, do you have a store or anything? Uh, I do not, um, but they can buy the uh, the trade paperback is still in print. So Oh, um, good. Okay. Yeah. All right, so issues one through five, uh, I'm guessing the, the regular places like in stock trades or uh, Amazon, something like that. So wherever you prefer yeah. to shop. Or That's a awesome. comic book shop should be able to order it. I will bug my uh, graham crackers and ask them if they can get one then. So what do you oh, got nice. there? Yeah. Oh, All you right. found it? Too. No, I, I'm loving that. I have a thing for oh, like the you. barbarian turtles and stuff. Oh, you did one for Josh, for Joshua. That oh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. He's got amazing. I love that. Thank you. The yeah, no, that yeah shout out to Josh even. So, yeah. yeah that's I right. love that. That is freaking awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I like uh, commissions, too. I, I don't know. I had that kind of a flurry of commissions the last few months, too. Uh, mostly Ninja Turtles, but uh, I'm awesome. for commissions. Yeah. That one's badass, too. I love that one where they're what all on top. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that was with the markers. Yeah, see, that's another that's another one that's just like issue 124. And I, like I said, yeah. I, I'm I'm a big fan. I, I like I like your style, and it it too. brings it. It's like right in there that line work with like Mobius and and Barry mm -hmm. Windsor Smith and all that. 
but your faces are so much better than Barry Windsor Smith's. And I'm sorry, but it's oh, <laughs> his just like they all look the same. Yours are like, oh, there's distinctive people. So, but styles, they change. So, you know, but it's, it's cool. But that's um, those are the questions that I had. Eric, did you have any questions for Karen? Oh, we forgot to ask the most important question. I was letting pizza. you ask that question. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, pizza. Okay. First off, what's your favorite pizza? Two, do you like pineapple on pizza? Uh, no pineapple. No pineapple on pizza. All right. That's um, a point for Eric. Okay. <laughs> I used to when I was younger, but I gave it up. Half credit. Um, <laughs> I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. I, I gave up smoking 10 years ago. So, you know, oh, I nice. mean, you know, like. Did yeah, you smoke pineapple, like Eric? I mean, no, but I'm just saying <laughs> I, sm I smoked and you, you gave up pineapple. I, asked, I quit smoking. So you gave up Maybe pineapple, pineapple express. Yeah. <laughs> That too. Okay. <laughs> that was a long yeah, time. Do you have um do you have a good uh, sort of Bay Area California pizza that you enjoy? Uh actually no. I mean there are good uh, pizza places in San Francisco, but it's just been so long since I, I used to get calzones at a place um called Sybil's on Bush that's Street. That's just a but... folded that's just a folded pizza. That makes sense. Yeah. Pizza pocket. Yeah. Hot pocket. <laughs> it's a glorified hot pocket. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, we we talked to uh, uh, our our friend Joel Zar, and he was telling us about a uh, peanut butter pizza. He's out in Cali yeah. too. I don't I don't know where, yeah, but um, he was he said uh, they actually mix peanut butter with the sauce and and kind of just put it through that way. And I'm like, what an interesting choice. And I, I know California has some interesting um, recipes because of the the. Like it's just a melting pot of like everybody comes in with their cooking styles. Like mm -hmm. so, you never know. Well, yeah. Yeah. So no pineapple. We we can we can respect that. That's that's fine. It's not <laughs> for everybody. You. you know. Yeah. Nothing it's against not, it. Yeah. That's okay. That's it's all right because Eric, you know, Francois Chow and I will be eating that uh, <laughs> when we hang out. That'll be and fine. And granite. And granite. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're like I brought this for you. It's it's pineapple pizza. And <laughs> so. All right. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, it, uh, with that, that's, that's all the questions that I had. I mean, um, I'm, I'm really glad that you were able to come on. Like I said, I'm, you could tell I'm a fan of your work. Eric is now a fan cause he's, he's seen some cool stuff. Yeah, um, I'm... best place. Uh, what we think best place to reach out is, uh, Instagram for folks to get a hold of you for commissions. Uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Any, uh, final thoughts there, Eric? No, uh, man, if, are you okay if I share your stuff on, on Facebook? Oh yeah, please, please do. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. We're 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 uh we're pretty big on sharing artists and yeah, you know, a bunch of other people, you know. We have quite a few people that we really, really, really share for, you know, we want to, you know, get their stuff out there as well. I mean, with you not being on Facebook. I mean, I, I figure it's a little tougher, but, you know, hopefully we can get more people to reach out. You know what I'm you saying? Can, um, you can still tag his Instagram page um, on Facebook. Okay. They'll let you do that. So that 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 works. So That'd be awesome. And, uh, yeah, well, we'll I appreciate do... it for sure. Yeah. And um, so, uh, folks listening, we're going to say goodbye to uh, Ken, and um, we will be right back with your pizza recipe of the day. Thanks for listening. Hi, this is Adam, a.k.a. Casey Jones from Casey Jones Livewire, and you're listening to Epic Tales from the Sewers. Time for a knuckle sandwich, punk. It's pizza time. And now, in a segment that we call Pizza Time, where we discuss any Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle or pizza-related food, I give you Pizza Time. Basic Sicilian Pizza. That's your pizza recipe of the day. Active, 40 minutes. Total, 1 hour and 20 minutes, plus overnight and 2 hours for rising. Serves about 8. For the dough, ingredients. You'll need 4 cups of all-purpose flour, plus more for dusting, 2 tablespoons of sugar, 2 teaspoons of kosher salt, 2 teaspoons instant yeast, 1 and 3 quarters cup of warm water, and 6 tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil, plus more for the bowl. For the pizza, 28 ounce whole peeled tomatoes, preferably San Marzano, one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt plus more for sprinkling, 12 ounces of whole milk mozzarella cheese thinly sliced. Make the dough, whisk the flour, sugar, salt, and yeast in a medium bowl. 
Pour the warm water into a large bowl and then add the flour mixture and stir until combined. Stir in two tablespoons of olive oil to make sure that it's very sticky dough. Turn it out onto a lightly floured surface and knead, dusting more with more flour as needed until the dough comes together and no longer sticks to your fingers. About two minutes. Transfer to a lightly oiled large bowl and turn to coat. Tightly cover with plastic wrap and refrigerate overnight. Step 2. Coat an 11 by 17 rimmed baking sheet with 3 tablespoons of olive oil. Add the dough and stretch it to fit the baking sheet. Brush with the remaining 1 tablespoon of olive oil. Loosely cover with plastic wrap and let rise at room temperature until puffy, about 2 hours. Step 3. Make the pizza. Position a rack in the upper third of the oven and preheat to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Combine the tomatoes and their juices and the salt in a medium bowl and crush well with your hands or a potato masher. Uncover the dough and sprinkle with salt. Gently place the baking sheet in the oven and bake until the crust is golden, about 20 minutes. Remove the crust from the oven, top with the sliced mozzarella and cover with two cups of crushed tomatoes. Bake until the cheese is bubbling through the sauce and it starts browning, about 15 to 20 more minutes. Step 4. Let the pizza stand 10 minutes, then remove it from the pan using a spatula to transfer to a cutting board. Let it cool 1 to 2 minutes before slicing. Pro tips. When putting the crust in the oven, be gentle. If you knock the baking sheet, the dough could deflate. You might want it to stay puffy. Good quality canned tomatoes make a big difference for this pizza. Look for San Marzano tomatoes from Italy. That's your pizza for the day. Basic Sicilian Pizza. Thank you for listening to the Epic Tales from the Sewers podcast. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were created by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. This podcast has no affiliation with Eastman, Laird, Mirage Studios, IDW Studios, Archie Comics, or Nickelodeon Studios. This podcast is a member of the Dorkening Podcast Network. Check out thedorkening.com for other podcasts. Epic Tales from the Sewers is recorded by Justin Cooper and Eric Will. Everyone thinks because you're a zombie, you don't know good coffee. Well, they're wrong. We have very active lifestyles. It's not all wandering the countryside aimlessly or scaring passing motorists. And we all love a good cup of joe. And there's only one brew that gets my seal of approval. Deadly Grounds Coffee is my guilty pleasure. Bold, robust, delicious. It's coffee that can wake the dead. <laughs> With over a dozen different roasts and flavors, Deadly Grounds can satisfy the most finicky of coffee addicts. The aroma is so intoxicating. It brings all of my neighbors out of the woodwork. Deadly Grounds coffee. Coffee to die for and zombie approved. It's good to get a little deadly. Use the front door! Oh, they're so disgusting. Greetings and Shabibans, we are the Retro Reductibus Cephala Podcast, a long-form bi-weekly show that celebrates all the things that made growing up awesome. Yeah, that sounds good, but I don't know what all those words mean. I think what Parasite seems trying to say is that on Retro Reductibus, we explore a range of retro goodness, from toys, video games, and movies, to cartoons, and even snacks and school lunches. Oh. And we do it all with a positive spin, a slew of killer guests, and some ahem, very adult language. And you know what else is cool? No. This crazy show is part of the Dorking Podcast Network, 
with new episodes every Tentacle Tuesday. It's there. And if waiting two weeks for a new episode gives you a sad, know that we drop bonus episodes all the time, like the off-format Crow's Nest and an interview series we call The Brick. You can listen to Retro Octopus on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or any app that's cool enough to carry the only show that celebrates all the things that make growing up awesome. It took me 10 years to make the perfect man cave. And then we took it over. And we made it into the multiversal chamber. Then I started my own podcast. And we took that over too. And we're the co-host, the Multiverse Kids. Yeah, and I'm the dad, the geeky dad. And every week, we what? We review the movies, shows, and books. Games and toys. Yeah. And sometimes we even have a special guest. So, join us every week on the Geeky Dad Podcast. Hello, intrepid listeners. This is the Generation Playlist Podcast, a podcast about music where we are your guides through a particular group or artist. We talk about the music, and then we make a customized playlist to share with you, our listeners. And you can check us out wherever you listen to podcasts, and find our playlists on Spotify. 